While the San Antonio Spurs are being somewhat patient and didn't make the major swing some expected this offseason, I think the moves they did make will make this a somewhat competitive team this upcoming season. Chris Paul took a deal to come play with Wenby because he believes he still has more in the tank, and while he clearly isn't what he once was, I think this will be a more impactful move than some anticipate. They also added Harrison Barnes, who I think will step in and be a quality piece on the wing. Combine this with not only another year of development for Wemby, but for the remainder of the Spurs' young core as well, and I think we have a team that will be exiting the bottom feeder phase of their rebuild. The Spurs are playing the long game while also making moves to impact the here and now, and while I know we all want Wemby to get a great team ASAP, with the way the Western Conference is looking, this is probably the right approach. Today I'll be reviewing the Spurs offseason, their roster situation, and why I think this Spurs team will win many more games than they have as of late. The biggest name the Spurs acquired this offseason was Chris Paul, and while I certainly did not expect this, I absolutely love this move for many reasons. First and foremost is obviously how he and Wemby will connect. Wemby already experienced a jump from sub-all-star to all-NBA caliber play when the Jeremy Soham point guard experiment ended after 33 games and Trey Jones was inserted, so just imagine what it'll look like with a basketball mastermind in CP3 instead. I made a whole video about this stark difference in production with an actual point guard on the court earlier this past season if you want to hear a little more in depth about this phenomenon. While Trey Jones is a good facilitator, Chris Paul, even at his advanced age, will open up the game for Wemby in ways we've never seen. Chris Paul went to the rebuilding Spurs because he wanted to play and prove he still has it, and I kind of believe him. Despite his role in Golden State this past season, he still managed to give you a bit over 9 points and nearly 7 assists to 1.3 turnovers a night while shooting over 37% from deep. Another reason I like this move so much is because now you will likely have either Chris or Trey on the court at most times, and as long as Wemby has one, he will be able to be much more effective. Another reason I love the Chris Paul move is because he will be in the ear of not only Wemby, but also the likes of Stefan Castle, Trey Jones, and Devin Vassell. Paul wanted a role like he had during his short stint in OKC, and I believe adding even a 39-year-old version will produce similar effects for the young core. This is also a completely risk-free acquisition that allows you to keep your treasure chest of draft assets and cap flexibility, unlike a rumored move such as acquiring a Trey Young. The Spurs have an underrated draft stash that I made a video on a while back. Don't think too much has changed outside of obviously this year's picks being used and traded, but it was uploaded about a year ago or so. Little off topic before we move on to the rest of the roster, the most valuable of their draft stash are easily the 2025 Hawks pick, 2026 Hawks swap, and the 2027 Hawks pick, all unprotected. While with them keeping Trey, I don't think they'll be a bottom feeder, I don't see a world where they're above 8th in the Eastern Conference at least next season, if not beyond, meaning that you'll probably see at least one, if not two lottery picks from these three. The next move the Spurs made was another masterful one that added another valuable piece to their draft stash. The Spurs got in on the DeMar DeRozan sign and trade and netted Harrison Barnes and an unprotected 2031 swap from the Sacramento Kings in exchange for nothing. The Kings sent out Barnes in the swap to San Antonio and Chris Duarte and two second rounders to Chicago in the deal that landed them DeMar DeRozan. The Spurs simply had the cap space to just absorb Harrison Barnes without need for matching salary and got a real draft asset in the process. While who knows what happens between now and 2031, one thing that should be certain is that the Spurs are at least a playoff team if not a top tier contender with a prime Wemby. This means that in all likelihood this swap would be used for at least a higher pick than the Spurs, if not a much higher one. Again, who knows what happens between now and then, but should De'Aaron Fox and or DeMontis Sabonis remain as key pieces, in all likelihood this Kings team would be on the downturn. The icing on the cake is that the Spurs also got a solid starter level player on a contract that is probably better than whatever they would have had to given out to reach the salary floor. While he is 32, the contract is only two more seasons at 18 and 19 million respectively. Worst case scenario, if you need the cap next summer, you could easily dump that expiring deal to a team that needs to reach the salary floor. But best case scenario, and honestly the likely scenario, the near 39% three-point shooter and double-figure scorer on just above 61% true shooting is a solid contributor to what should be a team jumping to at least near the 500 mark. I'm not gonna lie, I wanted to be impatient too and make a move like a Trey Young trade to get Wemby a competitive team as soon as possible, but I think they are taking the complete correct approach. The West is a bloodbath, and exhausting all of your assets and or your most valuable assets for maybe just a second round exit ceiling, but in all likelihood a first round exit, is not the way to go with a 20 year old surefire future superstar. 
The best way I can put this is three of the six of the Clippers, Lakers, Warriors, Suns, Pelicans, and Kings will miss the playoffs and one won't even see the play-in. Injuries may change some of this, but you get the point. Getting the likes of Chris Paul to help Wemby develop, allowing you to have growth without asset exhaustion is simply genius on the Spurs part. The other major part of the Spurs offseason was their number four overall selection, Stefan Castle. The Spurs had the 8th pick as well from Toronto, but traded it to Minnesota for future draft compensation. While I think they might have been able to get a little more for 8, I see the vision with not wanting too many prospects to develop at once, and deferring assets to potentially use in a trade down the line. Back to Castle though, while I am a strong believer in spacing and might have gone in a different direction, you can see why the Spurs selected Castle. It was a very Spurs pick to me. He is a 6'6 point guard who is a tenacious defender and was stamped as a winner at UConn. I don't necessarily subscribe to selecting people based on college team success, but it is something to note and I can see an organization like the Spurs liking that. The knock on Castle is his shooting, and as someone who watched Ben Simmons play with Joel Embiid for years, I am heavy on the max spacing for your star big. Castle is not Ben though, he does shoot it just not well yet. He could very well develop that shot in the Spurs development program. The Ben example is extreme obviously, but just a reference on the importance of spacing with a star big. Castle shot just 26.7% from deep last season at UConn, and he'll have to develop that somewhat to reach his full potential in the league. Another thing the slower approach does is give you more time to let prospects develop and not go all in instantly. The additions made by the Spurs this offseason were big, but it's this as well as some of the pieces that were already in place and how they'll mesh that make me think this team is destined for great improvement. First up, we obviously have Victor Wembanyama, and he is going to be absolutely amazing as we all know. He made all defensive first team and led the league in blocks in his rookie year, and I think an all-NBA leap is not out of the question. He was already a top defensive player of the year candidate and could very well win it this year as well. He was putting up all-NBA caliber numbers in the games in which he had an actual point guard starting, and now that you have Chris Paul in the mix as well, I am expecting a big leap from Wemby. Another thing you have to consider is that Wemby wasn't playing that many minutes last year too. So combine likely more minutes with also having a real point guard on the court, not only starting, but most of the time. And I think this is the perfect recipe to take Victor Wembanyama from an all-star caliber player to an all NBA caliber player in only his second year. The sky is the limit for Wemby. I personally think there is a chance he is the best player we have ever seen by age 25. Obviously that's a lofty expectation, but that should explain how much I believe in Wemby, and I mean, how could you not? If you've ever watched the guy play, he is absolutely ridiculous, and I think the Spurs are setting him up in a perfect environment to grow. The Spurs' current second biggest piece is undoubtedly Devin Vassell. Vassell has seen steady improvement since arriving in the league, and I don't see that changing now with the best playmaker he's ever played with coming in. Vassell's points per game, assists per game, true shooting percentage, and field goal percentage have improved every year of his four-year career thus far. Vassell has become a 20-point-per-game guy who shoots threes at a good volume while also making strides playmaking-wise. And to top it all off, he signed a five-year $135 million extension that kicks in this year that is descending for the most part. It's strange, it goes from a bit over 29 next season to exactly 27 for the next two, then to a bit over 24 and a half for the fourth year, and back to 27 flat for year five. As time passes, this contract will not only decrease in value for the most part, but will also take up less of the cap as time goes on. In the era of the aprons, having who I think could become a contending third option on a contract like this is beautiful. Look for Vassell to jump from 19 and a half last season to over 20 points a night and probably get his three point shooting back up to where it was in 22-23 while getting the best looks he's ever seen. It's not all that different though at 38.7% versus 37.2%. Vassell will be 24 when the season begins and I'm excited to see his improvement contribute to some level of success finally. Next up we have Jeremy Sohan, and while the point guard experiment didn't work as planned, there is still something to salvage from there. That being the ball handling reps Sohan had could prove valuable in his development. Sohan is a defensive specialist and could be your power forward next to Wemby in the front court for the future. The knock on Sohan is his shooting, but he did see stark improvement from his rookie season to his sophomore campaign. Sohan shot a measly 24.6% from deep on 2.4 attempts a night as a rookie, but this past season shot 30.8% on 3.1 attempts a night. This is far from great, but definitely a sizable increase. What this also tells me is that the Spurs are confident in their ability to develop jumpers, which is a great sign for Stefan Castle as well. 
So on has to develop one skill to become potentially an ideal modern four, and he looks on track to do so thus far. Next up we have Keldon Johnson, and my determination from the Spurs buzz is that he may be the odd man out. Trade rumors swirl during the offseason, but nothing materialized. Regardless of how his fit on this team may look right now, he undoubtedly has talent. He has averaged over 18 a night over the past three years, including 23 a night during the 22-23 campaign. He has been a near 40% three-point shooter on volume, despite falling to 33.7% over his past two seasons. I don't know if you can count on it getting all the way back to the 39.8% it was at, but I think it will at least rebound to the 36-37% to range with him getting the best looks he's ever gotten this upcoming season. He is also on a descending contract, making 19 next season and 17 and a half the following two, so I understand holding on for right now to see if it can work or potentially to build up his value more. The last somewhat key piece of the Spurs young core is Trey Jones. While he will be moved back to the bench, he will be a great backup facilitator and should 40-year-old Chris Paul need rest, he can definitely fill in and start. Excluding his rookie year where he shot five threes total, Trey is yet another example of consistent shooting improvement in the Spurs system. Jones was a sub 20% three point shooter on less than one attempt a game in year two, then jumped to 28.5% on 2.3 attempts in year three, and now to a semi-respectable 33.5% on 2.5 attempts a game this past season. Trey has become a double-figure scorer and 6-7 assist guy on respectable efficiency, and should his three-point shooting continue to improve, he could become one of the best backup ones in the league. The unfortunate part about that is that he is on an expiring deal, but then again, so is Chris Paul, and you could just pay Trey if you really feel like it. A team throwing a bag should he have stark three-point improvement again isn't out of the question though. I can't consider him part of the young core at 26 years old, but the last key piece on this team is Zach Collins. He definitely took a bit of a step back last season, but has shown ability as a stretch big in the past. He has two years remaining on his contract at 16.7 million and 18 million in the next two seasons, and should be easy to move on from should that be the direction the Spurs go. He has some redeeming qualities and can be a high quality backup to Victor while you don't need the cap flexibility to contend now. The Spurs have some other young pieces such as Malachi Branham, Blake Wesley, Julian Champagne, and Charles Bassey. A few of these guys could become rotational pieces, but I wouldn't expect much. I would expect some of these guys to be replaced with vets or new prospects next offseason. I will say though, as a Sixers fan, I was furious when we cut Charles Bassey, and I think he could become a solid backup big. He is coming off an ACL tear now though. City Sudoku is someone to look out for as well, but we pretty much haven't seen him to this point. The San Antonio Spurs are playing their cards better than I could even fathom, and I think this will pay out big time on the back end. It is undoubtedly the right path with the teams in the West right now, but I think this team simultaneously has the talent to become respectable. The only way I see them in the play-in picture is if Wemby has a massive jump, but regardless of that, this Spurs team will no longer be the bottom feeder they've been and will start moving back in the right direction. We saw the Spurs compete with great teams at times when Wemby was at his best even last season, and now they've improved significantly. You see something you've never seen before when you watch Wemby, and I'm happy that we'll be able to see him with an at least competent team, regardless of what the result this season is. I see the Spurs becoming a near 40 win team and gearing up towards their first playoff appearance in 2025-26. After two straight 22 win seasons and not touching 35 wins for the three years before that, the Spurs are finally back on the right track and I believe they'll be turning heads this season and become a competitive basketball team again. That's going to wrap this one up. If y'all enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, hit that noti bell, comment down below. You know what I mean? What are your thoughts on the Spurs additions this offseason? Again, I know, you know, it, you know, the Trey Young trade that was rumored, you know, some other trades, maybe Darius Garland, you know, like stuff like that, that people kind of wanted them to do and I wouldn't have, you know, been opposed to it. But I really like this approach. The West is just crazy, and there's really no point in exhausting your assets now, especially when you could probably get another, you're get another lottery pick from yourself, maybe get another lottery pick from Atlanta. Maybe if you know if a real superstar becomes available, you can package and go in next offseason. The Spurs can do pretty much any and everything they want from here on out, and that's a great place to be with a 20-year-old superstar. Once again, that's going to wrap this one up. If y'all could like the video, sub the channel. I would really, really appreciate it. It would help me out a ton. Comment down below, whatever, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.